Next, we'd have Brian Main, Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science, University of Michigan, and Research Associate Prof Professor at the Center for Political Studies and Institute for Social Research. So I will leave the floor to Brian. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, and thank you, Kate, for, for opening us up on this panel. So a few years back, my friend Todd Moss posted this graphic comparing how much electricity the average person uses in a bunch of low-income countries. And he compared it to the power used by his fridge. The fridge won. Now, his point was that the amount of energy that the typical Ghanaian or Kenyan has access to is not nearly enough to provide the basic benefits that we associate with energy access. Now, as disturbing as this is, it doesn't even capture the true magnitude of inequity in energy usage uh, within countries and around the world. So actual US per capita consumption um, I looked it up on the EIA website earlier today, uh, is about 10 times this usage. And so the US bar should be way, way higher. And on the, on the red bars, these are averages. There's actually huge portions of the populations within these countries whose consumption numbers are close to zero. We as a world have made tremendous gains in improving electricity access globally, but we need to set our our aims higher and tackle energy poverty, ensuring that people have sufficient, reliable, and affordable energy necessary to make a meaningful difference in their lives. And I'm grateful that Kate mentioned SDG 7 and the way in which actually the way we think about that should be broader. It's not simply about access, but it should be something that incorporates reliability, quality, and, uh, and affordability. Uh, the multi-tier framework surveys that have been mentioned have been a really important innovation that have helped push the analytical community forward in understanding that there are enormous variations in how much energy is used within different subpopulations within a country. But MTF is done in, uh, as far as I remember, a couple dozen countries around the world. And these are nationally representative surveys in most of the world we do not know where the energy poor reside and who they are. So our team has been tackling this by using satellite data. If we begin with uh, daytime satellite imagery, you see a lot. But actually, mo many of those pixels are not so interesting because they're not populated. We can zoom in and identify only the populated pixels highlighted in pink here. These are pixels in which a human building or structure is identified by computer techniques. And of each of these pixels, we then are faced with a classification challenge. Which of these pixels are energy poor and which are not? And the end output, the, the, the goal of the process, is to generate a classification scheme that can identify energy poverty. Now to do this, the primary input we are going to use is nighttime satellite imagery. Now, there's a long convoluted process that you need to incorporate if you actually want to use nighttime lights seriously because the images that come off of satellites are not perfectly clean. And we've talked about uh, data quality and accuracy before. There are, in fact, a couple really excellent lightning uh, projects that, uh, you, whose videos you can watch on this topic as well. But what we know is that if we want to extract low-level electricity use signals, we need to be able to account for the massive sea of noise that is inherent in satellite image signaling. Now, uh, there are really two types of locations, as we uh, noted in the earlier slide. There are places in which there is human activity, and there are other locations in which there are none. Our approach emphasizes the fact that we can learn a lot about the sensor, about the atmosphere, and about local level conditions by looking at unpopulated, uninhabited areas. Uh, on the 
left-hand side there are, uh, are depictions of light-level measurements over uninhabited areas of the globe for different types of land cover classifications. And the key point there is just to notice that there is a lot of noise. There's differences in the way in which lunar illumination interacts with the surface albedo of different land types. There are atmospheric disturbances that, uh, that the team uh, at NOAA and NASA work really hard to account for. Things like clouds and other types of things that can disturb data quality. But if we can learn the characteristics of the noise by looking at uninhabited areas, our insight or our approach is to then apply that learning to then look at places where there are humans to identify whether there's an anomaly. Is there something that looks dramatically different from what we would expect if this was an uninhabited area? So we do that by scouring over 250 terabytes of VIRS image data and associated metadata. All of that is publicly accessible on, the, on different sources, but the data source we use that we help compile is the Light Every Night Data Archive in partnership with the World Bank, and it's all on AWS. And so with these, we can then generate statistical probable, uh, probabilistic estimates that the likelihood of a human settlement is energy poor over a prolonged period of time. What we find is that there is a lot of energy poverty, far higher than the official counts that are often mentioned in terms of the number of people that still lack access around the world. The value of this settlement-based approach is that we can then zoom in on individual countries, individual locations, and time periods to track changes over time. In some recent work we've been uh, doing with the World Bank, we've been looking at Niger. This was a project in which uh, we began to evaluate the impact of World Bank-funded interventions uh, in one of the lowest access countries in the world. Speaking of interventions, there was a coup which interrupted our work, and so that work is now on hold, and we are shifting uh, in some respects to be looking at the impacts of uh, the recent economic and political instability. Does the approach work? It's really important to be able to validate any type of computational estimate that is generated because uh, I don't need to tell this audience, our computers are really good at generating numbers. Do they mean what we think they mean? In some cases, we do have comparison data against which we can compare. In other cases, we do the best we can. And so this is going to be an example of doing the best we can. We looked at nine countries and looked at census data in which the typical census question that is asked of every household is, what do you use for lighting in your home? And if they answered electricity, we're going to count that on the x-axis. On the y-axis is our measure of energy poverty, which is a little bit different. We are looking for uh, the number of, uh, of pixels in which there is no statistical evidence whatsoever of nighttime light output uh, in the nighttime time series. But overall, we do see a relatively good correlation in many countries. As I mentioned, the overall numbers that we tabulate when we look globally is that there are something close to 1.2 billion people that are energy poor. You might contrast that with the official number of something, I believe it's around 760 million people who do not have access. There's a lot more people that have nominal access, but don't actually benefit from any electricity at night. This is from some work that we've done in partnership with the UN Development Program uh, over the last couple of years in which they are using our data to now gen uh, to, uh, that, to populate uh, a new tracking feature that allows for the tracking of energy poverty across time and space. And uh, I'm particularly proud of this because this is one of the first metrics that is moving away from simple binary energy access measures in their effort to tackle SDG or to, to, to pursue SDG 7. And so this is available if you go to that 
data.undp.org site as well. Um, some of this other data is available on our website. Uh, you can look for the HREA project uh, with my name, and you should be able to find this page as well. So our computers are actually amazingly helpful at identifying the who, what, and where of energy poverty. But the real question we need to be asking is why. Why do people live in energy poverty, especially when there are so many resources being directed towards those communities? And seemingly, more and more data every single day on who and where these people are. So we're talking about artificial intelligence today, but let me make a plug for human intelligence. Because to answer the question why requires human insight. And that starts with talking with humans. So this is a, uh, a village I visited a uh, while back in northern India. Derhi was one of the poorest villages in northern India, uh, first identified as, as extremely poor in a living standard survey done by the World Bank many decades ago. But in the mid-2000s, it was seen as something of a great success story because for the first time, this village had been electrified. Officially, it was now in the record books, uh, coded officially as electrified, and you can see from the image uh, that there was electrical infrastructure that was installed. And I went to visit, expecting to hear tales of how uh, wonderful the introduction of electricity had been to this community. In fact, though, talking with real people, what I heard was something completely different. There was actual deep frustration at the entire process and rollout. They said some officials had come earlier in the year and done some mapping and planning and connected a handful of households. They installed all of this infrastructure. They registered a handful of us as consumers, and they started billing us for our new electrical connections. But the power almost never works. And these frustrated individuals told me that we are poorer now than we were before because now we have these bills we have to pay even though there's no electricity. What we know about energy poverty is that it is not random. It may be concentrated in disadvantaged communities, in politically marginal areas, or amongst ethnically marginalized groups. And to understand the processes that lead to inequity in energy access requires investigation and human insight. It's also important to realize that the barriers to uh, the energy solutions we're talking about today are not always simply technical, financial, or about a lack of data. And I think Kate hinted at this as well. Several years ago, I uh, had an extraordinary high-level meeting with a, uh, with a government of a country that I won't name. But around that table that day was the deputy power minister surrounded by political advisors, utility commissioners, and engineers. And we presented some early versions of this work showing how we were tracking en energy access gaps and identifying persistent power outages using our satellite methods. And I zoomed in on two of the most energy poor areas in that country. We offered to partner with them, I, noting that a lot of the data was already open source and public, and offered to develop uh, and share uh, access to information that would allow them and anyone who wanted to to identify every unelectrified village and track their light signatures from space. In hindsight, I should have realized that every single government official in that room that day had a lot more to worry about than just reducing energy poverty. They actually had careers to worry about. And as government officials, with an election coming up, the last thing they needed was a tool that would shine potentially a spotlight on every area where the government was failing in its public service delivery attempts. 
the whole project got swept under the rug because it did not account for the political realities of that context. And so data we've talked about today and the tools that we can develop are hugely important. And yet, we can't forget that fundamentally the barriers that exist sometimes are structural, sometimes are institutional, sometimes are hidden biases, but these are fundamental things that need to be accounted for and addressed as well. Thank you.